угрозы им нарушены. Я мест Андрей Квизиц. То имя гвоздя в целой жизни посполитой. Это короны. Иисус. Чем мне устигать моего крулевского брата через всю Польшу? И так бы допадло. Срада! Jej wiary we mnie. Przysięga. O mój ojczyzna miła! Za mną! Kwidzic, panne porwa. Pan Hinga. Iwat, król Szwecji! Drejce! Drejca! Drejca! Diabli. Synkowie, odpuśćcie. Odpuszczam. Nie pójdę za człowieka, na którym ciążą łzy i krew ludzka. In 1974, director Jerzy Hoffman returned to the world of Henry Sienkiewicz with his adaptation of the second book of the trilogy, Potop, or The Deluge for us English speakers. Now, Daniel Obachensky, who I'm sure you'll remember as the villainous Asia from the previous film, takes top billing this time around as Andres Kimmicks, a young officer of some renown. Now, Kimmick and his men are returning to the town of Lubitsch for the winter after a campaign, and they decide to stop and meet his betrothed, Alaka. Played here by Malgozita Bronek. Alaka is almost immediately taken with Kimmich, yet tries to play it cool. But it isn't long before she gives into her emotions, and they celebrate their now budding romance the only way this franchise knows how. With a romantic sleigh ride through the snow. During the sleigh ride, one of Kimmich's men arrives to inform him that some of his soldiers have started taking supplies by force and burning a city. Kimmich informs him that he's going to go investigate, but tells the men that came with him from Lubitsch to return to Lubitsch and wait for his return, and to obey Olanka's orders. Then he goes to deal with him. It isn't long before his men in Lubitsch become restless, at first asking Olanka to allow them to take her servants with them to find Kimmich, which she denies and tells them that they were told to obey her orders, she's not taking her servants, and they need to simply wait. They then go to a tavern where they start a fight with some locals, and are quickly massacred by said locals. Kimmich returns to Alanka's home and tells her what happened while he was away, including how his men killed many of the peasants and even stripped some of the men naked and whipped them in the streets. Alanka is horrified to hear of the brutish ways he handled things and even accuses him of murder. She confesses to him that she sees good in him and that she believes it is his men who persuade him to behave in such an abhorrent manner and tells him that he will have to choose between his men or her. Kimmich then returns to Lubitsch, only to find the bodies of his men that the townspeople slaughtered. He finds one of his men still barely alive, and who with his last breath tells his commander who killed him. Kimmich becomes enraged, and with his remaining men he takes revenge on the nearby village of Omoltovich, burning the village to the ground. Being pursued for his crimes, Kimmich goes to Alanka for help, who initially hides him from the authorities, but as soon as they leave she tells him to take her horse and never return. Meanwhile, Colonel Michael Wojewski, 
played once again to perfection by Thaddeus Lomanek, is healed from a serious injury depicted in the film's opening, and is enjoying a meal with Alanka's guardians when word reaches them that Kimmich has taken Alanka hostage. The men make their way to Alanka's home, but it is soon revealed that Kimmich has a barrel of gunpowder inside and threatens to blow up the home and everyone in it unless he's allowed to leave. Michael challenges him to a duel, stating that if he wins, he may go free. And what follows is easily the greatest sword fight ever put to film, but more on that later. It becomes apparent almost from the start that Kimmix is no match for Michael, who toys with him a bit before striking the final blow and winning the fight, but Michael doesn't kill Kimmix, and orders that his wounds be treated. Michael informs Kimmix that he was sent by the Hetman himself to recruit Kimmick for an upcoming military campaign, and that if he should decide to serve the Commonwealth in the upcoming war, then he just may be able to restore his reputation and gain the forgiveness of his countrymen. Kimmick agrees and begins to assemble a new company of men. Hetman Yanath Redesvel, played by Vedislav Henzias, summons the nobles to his court, where Onfri Zagoba, this time played by Kazmarez Vizhenires, informs everyone that the Swedish have broken their treaty with the Commonwealth and began an invasion. After hearing the news, Hetman Radezvel asks to speak with Kimmich privately to inform him that he has invited Olanka to the feast so that they may make up and ask in return only that Kimmich swear an oath on the cross to never betray him. Kimmich, of course, obliges as he is grateful for the opportunity to be reunited with Olanka. That night at the feast, Radezvel goes to make a toast and asks that all who are loyal join him. And then in a scene that classic Simpsons fans will appreciate, he proceeds to toast their new Swedish overlord and King Karel Gustav of Sweden as the new rulers of the Commonwealth. Confusion is immediate, as Elgoba is the first to stand up and proclaim Radezvel a traitor, throwing down his mace in defiance, with many of the other nobles and attendants following suit. Guards are called in, and Olanka voices her disgust with the hetman's action, and tells Kimmix he must choose the side. Kimmix is not sure what to do. He is visibly upset with the hetman's choice, but also swore an oath on a cross not to abandon him. Michael, Zalgoba, and the other colonels who declare Radisvil a traitor are imprisoned, and Kimmich is brought before the Hetman, who then explains his desire to become king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Kimmich agrees to stay loyal, and even puts down an uprising to free the colonels, much to Michael's dismay. Radisvil plans to have the colonels executed, but Kimmich pleads for their lives, and the Hetman agrees to spare their lives and turn them over to the Swedish instead. The colonels are escorted to the Swedish by Ro Kowalski, played by Krzysztof Kowalowski, an officer is seen as something of a fool and has a reputation for following his orders to the very letter. So Goba strikes up a conversation with Kowalski and convinces him that he's a long-lost uncle. And upon getting him drunk, Zabolga is able to escape and get Michael's men to come free the colonels, who then recruit Kowalski into the ranks. Kimish goes to Alanka's to try and convince her to leave with him and says he will move her by force if he must. But before he can do so, Michael and the others show up to stop him. Michael orders that Kimmich be shot, and he is taken outside, but Zalgoba finds the letter from Hetman Radisvel that proves it was Kimmich who pleaded for their lives, and the execution is stopped. Michael says that Kimmich is free to go as he likes, but before he leaves to return to Hetman Radisvel, Zalgoba shows him Kowalski's orders, which state that the colonels were to be shot as soon as they arrived in the custody of the Swedish. Kimmich then leaves to confront the Hetman for lying to him. Hetman Radisvel once again tells Kimmich that he was doing it for the good of the Commonwealth, but this time Kimmich is not convinced. But it isn't until he meets with the Hetman's cousin, Prince Bogoslav Radzisvel, played by Lezik Zelavinsky, that he learns the full truth of what the Hetman and his cousin are up to. Now knowing that he has chosen the wrong side, Kimmich plots to kidnap Bogoslav and turn him over to Michael Vodiowski in a show of good faith. But the plan ultimately fails, and Bogoslav escapes, nearly killing Kimmich in the process. You have to feel bad for Daniel Obolensky's characters here. I mean, we're two films in, and he has two failed kidnappings. The poor guy just can't catch a break. Kimmich's men retreat into the forest and come across the hunter's lodge where they take refuge. But it isn't long before the hunter and his sons show up, who, as luck would have it, are survivors of Kimmich's men from his siege at Volmatovich. The men are happy to see their former commander and are eager to help him out and tend to his wounds. It isn't long before a group of soldiers loyal to Michael Vodiowski come across Kimmich's camp and recognize him, but they're unaware that he's turned against the Radizvels. A fight soon breaks out. Kimmich orders his men to not kill any of the soldiers, and once the fighting stops, he tells them to dress the wounds and send the men on their way. Realizing that his name is not to be trusted on either side, Kimmich takes on a new name and tells his men that even if beaten, they are to only refer to him by his new alias. He then decides that the best course of action is for him to meet with the King of Poland, who is now living in exile. Hetman Radisvel realizes that he doesn't have the manpower to fight Michael's troop, and so orders his cousin, Prince Bogoslav, to get reinforcements from the Swedish. The prince does as he is told, but being a womanizer and seeing an opportunity given Olanka and Kimmich's relationship, 
He takes Alonka with him and begins courting her. On the road to meet the Polish king, Kimmix and his men come across a Swedish noble and listen in on his conversation, discovering that the king of Sweden plans to attack the fortress-like monastery of Janus Gora. Kimmick changes course to warn the monastery, who initially do not believe him, but soon realize that he is telling the truth, and preparations are made to defend Janus Gora. An envoy from the hetman comes to see Bogoslaw and informs him that the Swedish never arrived, and that his cousin has fallen ill, and his castle will soon fall unless the prince comes to his aid. But Bogoslaw, in an almost comedic fashion, tells the envoy that his cousin can hold up for a few more days, as he's too busy parting at the moment to aid in the fight. The hetman dies just moments before Michael Vodiyoski and his men take the castle. The battle for Janus Gora rages on with Kimmich's men putting up a strong defense, but the Swedish are simply trying to buy time while they await the arrival of a large cannon that could change the course of the battle in their favor. The Swedes decide to send an envoy, Kukulovinsky, to try and convince the monks to surrender. The ploy fails and the battle continues as the giant cannon draws near. The heavy cannon arrives and try as they might, the monks' defense begins to fall and the defenders take heavy losses. Knowing that the wall is about to collapse, Kimmix volunteers to go behind enemy lines and blow up the cannons. The plan works, but Kimmix is unable to get away in time and is knocked unconscious from the explosions. The Swedes take him prisoner, but Kukulowinski recognizes him as Babinich, his alias, but in his injured state, Kimmix confesses his true identity to the Swedes. The Swedes decide to have Kimmix shot, but Kukulowinski convinces them to spare his life, not for any noble reason, but so that he can torture Kimmix for insulting him earlier. Kimmich's men soon arrive to mount a rescue, and Kimmich and his men ride off to find the Polish king, as they had been doing before the siege of Janus Gora. The king believes all that Kimmich tells him, but also informs him that Bogoslaw has sent word that Kimmich had planned to kidnap the king and turn him over to the Swedes. Kimmich understandably goes into a rage and faints, leading many of the king's council to believe that he is in fact Kimmich's, or a relative of Kimmich's, and therefore cannot be trusted. The king ignores this and begins making plans to return to the Commonwealth and push back the Swedish invasion. While traveling, one of the king's men says he overheard one of Kimmich's men calling him colonel and doesn't believe they are getting the entire truth out of him. The king orders that Kimmich's is brought to him personally before being questioned, but a group of Swedish soldiers arrive before that can happen. Kimmich's leads the fight, and a group of Polish soldiers that were laying in wait in the forest soon join and dispatch the Swedes quickly. <laughs> Kimmich's is injured in the fight, and when the king comes to speak with him, he immediately confesses that he is, in fact, Andres Kimmich's before passing out. While having dinner with Selgoba and Michael Vodiowski, the king asked them about Kimmix. They explained that they feel he is a good-hearted man overall, but that he did betray the king when he sided with Hetman Radisvel. Kimmix enters the room, and Zelgoba and Michael confirm that he is who he says he is, and the king informs him that he is on their side now and should be trusted. It is then that Kimmix learns that Alanka had been taken in by Bogoslaw. Meanwhile, Bogoslaw is planning to marry Olanka, but she tells him that her grandfather will state that she is either to marry Kimmix or join a convent, and that even if the will did not state this, she does not love him and would not marry him. Bogoslaw goes into a rage and tries to force himself onto Olanka, but one of his men betrays him and helps her to escape. The Poles begin to push back the Swedish forces, and even the Tartars show up to help, but the Polish king is unsure of their loyalty. Kimmix asks that they be put under his command, and his request is granted. After a major battle, Kimmix and Bogoslaw engage in a one-on-one -on -one fight to the death. The two men are evenly matched, but Kimmix is ultimately victorious and takes Bogoslaw captive. Bogoslaw informs Kimmix that if he dies, he has sent orders to have Alanka killed, and so Kimmix lets him go free, as he doesn't know that Alanka has in fact escaped from Bogoslaw's castle. Kimmix plans to go looking for Alanka and tells Michael that he will be back within two weeks' time. Many weeks pass, and Alanka is in talks to donate her land to the church when she sees a sleigh heading towards her home. She goes to check on the passenger and sees that it is Kimmix, having been shot by the Swedes. He now lies dying and wishes to pass at Lubitsch. Alanka prays for Kimmix to recover, and soon he does, escaping death once more. Alanka admits that she still loves him, but cannot marry him due to seeing him as a traitor. But during a Sunday Mass, Michael and Zelgoba deliver a letter from the king, which tells of Kimmix's deeds and offers him a full pardon. Alanka asks him to forgive her, and he does, and the two plan to marry once more, celebrating their engagement once again with a sleigh ride through the snow. What can one say about Potop that I didn't already say about Pan Vodiyoski? I called Pan Vodiyoski epic. I kind of need to correct myself here. That's sort of a mini epic. Potop is epic in every sense of the word. I already mentioned how Thaddeus Lominick is absolutely perfect once again as Michael Vodiowski and almost steals the show, and that's something you're going to hear a lot from what I'm about to say. All the cast in this movie are so perfectly cast. 
They all almost steal the show. It is truly an ensemble cast like no other. Kazmierz Vitsnerez is just as fantastic as Mieczysław Pawlowski has on Fries Algoba. His approach to it is a little bit different. He even looks different. I mean, what with Mieczysław being bald and Kazmierz is clearly not, but also the makeup. In the books, Zalgoba is known for having this pronounced feature on his head of a bullet wound. Uh, it's not really visible in Pan Vodiyoski. In fact, I don't recall noticing it, but it is an old print of the film. Maybe it is there, and I just haven't noticed. In this case, it's almost overly pronounced, and if you're not aware of this character's trait, as soon as you see him, you might think, who is that? Because it's a different actor, and he looks very different, and you might think his forehead looks a little weird. But i got to give the makeup department props. It's great that they were able to incorporate that. And everything I said about Mr. Slaw's performance in the last movie really carries on over here, despite it being a different actor. Why it was a different actor, I have no idea. I've tried to look up information on this and haven't been able to find anything. But it doesn't take anything away from the character. It's still very much the same character, just by a different actor. And the performance is so spot on. But of course, the big one is Daniel Obolensky's portrayal as Andres Kimmich's. Everything I said about Asja comes through here. Remember how I said, yeah, he's the villain of the last film, but he still came off as sympathetic? You get that here. At the start of the film, Kimmich is not a likable character, but the way Daniel Obolensky portrays him, much like Asja, you see this good in him. You see the good in him that Olanka sees, and there's really not any other actor who could have portrayed this. Now, I've heard that when Obolensky was asked to take on this role, he was pretty reluctant at first. He didn't see himself as a leading man, plus his role in the previous film he thought might confuse audiences. But he didn't want to offend director Yerzy Hoffman, so he reluctantly agreed to it. And this just shows how good of a director Yerzy Hoffman is, and that he saw everything he needed in Daniel Obolensky to portray the perfect Kimmich. Honestly can't see another actor taking on that role. And Mel Gozeta Brownick as Olanka is absolutely perfect. That same chemistry that Thaddeus Lomanek and Magdalena Zavalaska had in the last film, it's here too. She is a fantastic leading lady, and she's just as strong as Basha was in the previous film. Despite spending most of the film as the sort of damsel in distress, she also comes off as a strong independent woman, especially for this point in history. She's absolutely believable as a strong leader, such as the scene where Kimmich's men come and demand that she turn over her servants to them, and she stands up to them and doesn't back down. But she's also believable as the damsel in distress halfway through the movie when she's taken in by Bogoslaw. I mean, the guy's a womanizer, and he uses every trick he can to convince her to come with him. And although a minor part, I have to give credit to Krzysztof Kolowski as Rokolowski. He's great. He only has a handful of lines. He's only in a few scenes. But he just dominates these scenes he's in. You believe he's this absolute fool who takes everything literally. At one point, he's asked by Zolgoba if he's married. And he says, no, I'm Mr. Kowalski. And points to his saber and says, this is Mrs. Kowalski. And it's just absolutely hilarious. Even without subtitles, the way he delivers the line is fantastic. You can actually see this character as a relative of Zolgoba. And ironically... Christoph would go on to play Zelgoba almost 20 years later in Jerzy Hoffman's adaptation with Fire and Sword. So there's a little bit of sweetness you see when you go back and rewatch this movie after watching with Fire and Sword and see these two actors interacting together who eventually played the same character, just one being the younger version of him. And let's talk about the villains because Vadas Lahenzia is absolutely perfect as Janis Radisvel. This is a character who historically is going to be hard to portray as a sympathetic character. The Radzvel family has basically disavowed his and Bogoslaw's actual involvement in the real-life deluge, stating that the family had nothing to do with it and that it was the actions of these two individuals on their own and acting against the family's wishes. But he comes off as sympathetic. Even after Bogoslaw tells Kimmitz their actual plan, you still think that Yanis kind of maybe thinks he's doing the right thing. Whereas Bogoslaw is just coming off as greedy and trying to grab power. In many ways, Vladislav's portrayal as Radisvel is equal to Obolensky's portrayal as Asya in the previous film. Yeah, he's kind of an evil bastard, but you still feel bad for him. The scene where he dies, and Vodiyoski and his gang come into the room, and they take a moment of like silent respect? You get it. He was their friend at one point. Yes, he betrayed the Commonwealth, but there he was still a friend, and you do feel a little bit of sadness at his demise. And also the fact that he simply died of an illness and was never brought to justice for his crimes against the Commonwealth. And let's talk about Lezik Televinsky's portrayal of Prince Bogoslav Radisvel. 
this guy is easily one of my favorite film villains of all time. I mean, yes, he was a real person, but as far as movie villains go, I'd say he's up there with someone like Darth Vader. He's that good, and his portrayal here is fantastic. You see him, and he looks kind of like your typical noble, kind of a fop character, but he's not. He plays it up, but he is a Polish noble. He can't handle himself, and people are afraid of him. He is cruel, and he is mean, and he's a badass that you wouldn't want to fight, but he also comes off as sort of a feminine, and it really works for him. He really owns it. He's kind of the guy most of your Victorian aristocratic goth guys in high school were probably trying to impersonate, but they just didn't know it because they didn't see this movie. He's kind of that guy. And the scene where he's a womanizer, he's absolutely perfect and believable in that part. And when he's evil and cruel and ordering that his men be tortured or killed, well, he's evil and cruel. And you actually fear him. You fear for his men. You know something bad is going to happen to them. This guy is the absolute perfect villain. And you almost feel bad that he gets away in the end. But again, he is based on a real historical person. And he was not killed at that battle let alone killed by a fictional character like Kimmicks, so he had to get away. And a little bit of background. In the previous review, I mentioned that one of Michael Wodiowski's enemies was gaining power to become possibly become the new king of Poland. That character, of course, was Prince Bogusław Radetzvel. So it ties into the last movie a bit, but more so in the books than the movie. Again, he's not even mentioned by name in Pan Wodiowski. And it's not needed because you would need this story to fully grasp that. The soundtrack this time around is composed by Kazmierz Sorokci. And everything I said about the previous film soundtrack kind of holds over here. It works great for the movie. It really does set the tone of the film. But it's not something you're going to come back to again and again. Of the three soundtracks, like I said, with the previous film, I listen to it on occasion because I have it, but it's not something I put on often. Again, it sets the tone of the film, and it's great within the universe of the film. But if you're looking for an epic sweeping film score to go with this epic sweeping film, it doesn't really hold up the way you probably would hope it would. But it's a decent enough listen, and again, it works within the movie, so it's not going to take anything away and bring you out of the film. It will actually help bring you into it, you're just not going to probably go out, buy a copy, and listen to it. Okay, so let's get into this. I mentioned before that YouTuber Skelegram did a video on the sword fight between Vodiyoski and Kimmix. I'm not going to get into it quite like he did. I will link his video in the description of this one, but I just want to say this is absolutely the single greatest, most realistic sword fight ever put on film. And that's what I personally like. As a guy who spent many of my younger years studying martial arts, especially different fencing styles, both Asian and European, I appreciate when my sword fights are realistic, not the overly flashy stuff you get in most films. Though that does work for some things, like in The Princess Bride. But this film needed something more realistic, and it got it. It got it down spot on. But it's not just the choreography of the fight. It's the emotional investment that goes behind this. A good sword fight is good, but you need to have an emotional investment in the characters, and this one delivers. The first scene in the film has Michael Wodiowski being injured. You see them bringing his body and taking off the bandages and it's revealed that it's, it's him and you think he might be dead. And later on in the film, when he's talking about his injuries, he mentions having lost the use of his right arm and that he didn't think he'd ever be able to hold the saber again. That he's not sure his skills are quite as good as they are. And he immediately gets word of Kimmich's actions and has to go to confront him. Meanwhile, Kimmich has actually been shown to be quite competent with a saber earlier in the film. So we have Wodiowski, who we know is like the greatest swordsman in all of Poland. He's never lost a duel. He's only fought one that ended in a draw. And here we have Kimmich, who we've seen to be quite competent. And Wodiowski may not be at his best. He's even doubting himself. And then the fight starts. And Wodiowski just dominates it and toys with him. Honestly, I've not read the entire book of the Deluge. But the sequence in the book is actually quite humorous, with Wodiowski treating the whole thing as a fencing lesson and giving Kimmich's pointers. They obviously couldn't do that for time in the film, just the time they needed to film this, but it still has that sort of same air. The banter between them is great. It has some of the best lines ever, like them fighting in the rain, which again doesn't happen in the book. But here they're fighting in the rain, and... Uh, 
Vodiyoski says something like, it seems a shame to, to die in such weather, and Kimmich replies with something like, the angels are weeping for today, they know they, they'll bury a colonel, and it's just great dialogue. There's a scene where Vodiyoski disarms Kimmich, and he just, you know, Kimmich is thinking, oh, this is it, and Vodiyoski, being this noble hero type, won't attack him when he's unarmed and just you know just looks at him, points at his saber and goes, pick it up. And the best part, of course, is toward the end when Kimmich realizes he has been outmatched this entire time and he sort of rolls his eyes, looks at Vodiyoski and goes, just spare me the embarrassment. Not to mention one of the most famous lines that many of you Witcher fans will know of, you swing that thing like a flail, which is a great insult because a flail being a peasant's weapon and these being the nobles of Poland it's just fantastic. Everything about it is great, but you have this emotional investment in it, not just this excellent choreography, especially them having made Pan Vodiyoski first. We're invested in Vodiyoski as a hero. We don't want to see him lose. And at this point in time, Kimis is coming off as the villain. But at the same time, again, Olanka sees good in him, and the way Oblyensky portrays him, we as an audience see that good in him too. You don't want him to die here, and you're kind of unsure of what's going to happen, and it just... It really pulls you in, and despite having seen this film multiple times and having watched the fight on YouTube even more times and knowing how this is going out every time I watch this film or just the sequence, I am legit on the edge of my seat. I am so invested in it, and honestly, you will be too. It's one of the highlights of the film and almost a shame it happens so early on. There's also a lot of subtext in this film. Vladimir Gromov actually theorized that the story isn't as straightforward as people think, with Kimmich being sort of like the Polish people and Olanka representing the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth itself, and how one is not born into their country but has to earn their country, in much the same way that after everything Kimmich goes through, he has to earn Olanka's love. It is a great article. Again, I'm going to link this in the description. It's a fantastic read that also gives you a great behind-the-scenes of all three of the films in the series. If there's one downside to this film, it's that it is long. It is around five and a half hours, so rounding it up, six. It's a six-hour Polish film that most of you are going to have to watch with subtitles, and that's going to intimidate a lot of people. But as I've said before, how long would it take you to read the book? This is probably the better way to go, at least in my opinion, as a person who reads rather slowly. But if you are at all curious in this film, but the length intimidates you, you're in luck. Because in 2014, for the 40th anniversary, a new cut, retitled Potop Relivivius, was released. That's actually the version that I used the trailer for at the beginning of this, as I couldn't find the original trailer for this film. They cut out almost two hours of the film, and although I myself have never seen this version, I heard it got a lot of praise. One of the biggest complaints about the original film is how long it is, and that modern moviegoers really can't grasp it. So my recommendation, if you can find the 40th Anniversary Edition and you're at all curious and it has subtitles, watch that version. And if you fall in love with it like I have, then go ahead and find the original almost six-hour version and give that a try. This movie, again, it is an epic among epics. It is a nearly flawless film in every possible conceivable way. It is the second most popular film in Polish history by ticket sales. I tried to find out what the first place was, but again, did not have much luck with that. And I can't praise it enough. But compared to Pan Wodiowski, I kind of like the former film better. Uh, it's just a bit faster moving. This is not a film that I sit down and watch often. In fact, I've never sat down and watched it in one go. I'm usually watching part one and then part two. And also... Although most people say this is the absolute perfect film and the best of the franchise, and I can see why they would say that, it's still not even my favorite. That goes to the final film of the series, the first chronologically, with Fire and Sword, which we'll take a look at next time, which, in my opinion, is one of the single greatest movies ever made, and I hope I can convince you of the same. But I don't want to start ranting and gushing on that film just yet, You'll have to wait until next time when we take a look at Jerzy Hoffman's 1998 adaptation of Henry Sienkiewicz with Fire and Sword. I am Kowalski, and this is Pani Kowalska.